For our reading this week, uh, we finish the book of Matthew and then we get into the book of Mark and we almost make our way in through the entire gospel of Mark. Now one of the things you're going to notice with the gospel of Mark is that it really has more of a fast-paced feel. Now depending on your translation, you're going to see different words such as and and then or immediately and you see this over and over again. Even with the very beginning uh, chapter of Mark, it's like Jesus gets baptized and then he immediately goes into the wilderness and then he immediately uh, begins preaching. Again, it's just this very fast-paced feel to this book. Now, one of the things, too, with the Gospel of Mark, uh, because it has this fast-paced feel, there's not a, a lot of teaching. Now, there is some teaching, but as you may have noticed with the Gospel of Matthew, there's these big blocks of teaching that Jesus did, such as the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, but this isn't so much the case with Mark. Again, it's very fast-paced. Uh, he's uh, more action, uh, more events in the life of Jesus. Now, when it comes to the author of Mark, we're actually given some information about him throughout the New Testament, and I want to highlight a few of these. Well, first of all, in the Gospel of Mark, we may be given a reference uh, by Mark about himself in chapter 14. Now, what takes place is that Jesus is arrested and then he's, he's brought off to trial. And we get this kind of odd uh, couple comments about how this young man was there following and watching the situation. But then this young man, he gets seized by the guards, the struggle ensues, and then he has to kind of wrestle out of his clothes and, and take off naked. So again, it's kind of this odd story. It really doesn't need to be there. It doesn't add a whole lot. And so many scholars think this is Mark uh, saying, hey, this was me. I was watching some of these events unfold. Now also, when we get to the book of Acts, uh, we run into Mark. And he's, he's known actually as John Mark. Now, a couple different characters that we need to highlight as we kind of understand who Mark was a little bit better. One is Paul and Barnabas. Now, Paul, he comes to faith in a very dramatic way, okay? He used to terrorize the church. He hated Christians. And then uh, Jesus appears to him, and he becomes a believer. Well, because he used to persecute the church, many people were afraid of him. But this man named Barnabas, he actually takes Paul under his wing. He's very kind to him. They develop this relationship. And so as the years unfold, Paul and Barnabas, they set out on this missionary journey. Now, John Mark is a cousin of Barnabas, and so Barnabas, he wants to take John Mark along. And so off they go on this journey. Well, something happens where Mark deserts them. Now, we're not told in the book of Acts what takes place. Maybe he got homesick, maybe he was fearful, uh, but whatever the situation is, he goes back. Well, Paul and Barnabas, they complete their journey, they come back, and, and kind of as the days again unfold, they eventually go back on another missionary journey. And Barnabas wants to take John Mark with them again. Well, Paul does not want to do this. And, and actually, we read that this fierce disagreement took place between Paul and Barnabas because of Barnabas wanting to take Mark. And so what happens is actually they split up and Paul, he takes Silas and, and they go on a journey and then Barnabas, he takes Mark and, and off they go. But this is not the last time that we, we kind of see Paul and Mark interact. When we get to the letter of Colossians, Paul, he's writing this great letter and then he ends naming different people and he mentions Mark. And so this is many years after this disagreement that had taken place. And so what has happened is Paul and Mark have been restored in their relationship. Also, in the book or the letter of 1 Peter, Peter mentions Mark and he says that Mark is his son. Now he's not talking about Mark being his literal son, but his son in the faith. He's a very close a companion and associate. And what is interesting about that is many scholars believe that Mark, when he wrote his gospel, most of the material he got was from Peter. And Peter was giving this eyewitness account of what took place when he was with Jesus. So Mark was close with Peter, and so he wrote this down, which I think is, a, is pretty cool how we kind of came to this, this book or this gospel of Mark. But what I love about this is that you know, you could kind of hear this from Mark, and maybe he thought this, maybe other people, that because he had deserted Paul and Barnabas, maybe his time uh, being really useful in ministry was over. But yet through the gospel, the restorative uh, power of the gospel, their relationship, Paul and Mark, was restored, and then eventually Mark writes this wonderful gospel. And I just love that, because you may be thinking, maybe you sinned, or maybe you've done something uh, maybe the Lord won't use you, uh, but look to this example of Mark and that you can still be used in some mighty ways by the Lord. 
Now, I want to highlight something in Mark chapter 6. I love this story. And the reason I love it is as we go through the different New Testament books, uh, we get references to the Old Testament. So all this hard work that you did this last nine months of reading the Old Testament, it's going to pay off. So when we get to the book of Romans, for example, Paul, he, he points back to the Old Testament over and over again. Now, what we saw with the Gospel of Matthew is that when Matthew wrote this, he also referenced uh, the Old Testament, and he did it in some more direct ways. He would say, you know, this was done to fulfill the prophet Isaiah. Now, Mark doesn't do too much of this, but he gives us references to the Old Testament. And I want to show you one of these because it may not exactly stand out to us. All right, so let's read Mark chapter 6, verse 45. So it says this, Immediately, right, there's that word, this fast pace. Immediately, Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to Bethsaida. While he dismissed the crowd, after leaving them, he went up on a mountainside to pray. Later that night, the boat was in the middle of the lake, and he was alone on land. He saw the disciples straining at the oars because the wind was against them. Shortly before dawn, he went out to them, walking on the lake. He was about to pass by them. But when they saw him walking on the lake, they thought he was a ghost. They cried out because they all saw him and were terrified. Immediately he spoke to them and he said, Take courage, it is I. Do not be afraid. And then he climbed into the boat with them and the wind died down. Now I want to highlight a few things here because what Mark is doing is actually showing that Jesus is God, that Jesus is Yahweh. And we may not you know, catch this on a first reading. So a couple things. One, Jesus is walking on water. I mean, this is pretty amazing. And so Mark is showing that Jesus is above creation. He's above nature. But we get kind of this odd mention that Jesus, as he's walking on the water, he was going to pass by them. And we read that and we say, okay, was Jesus just kind of saying, hey guys, I'm walking on water? It's kind of this odd comment. Well, what Mark is doing is actually pointing back to the book of Exodus. In Exodus chapter 33, you may remember this, that Moses is having this conversation with the Lord and he asked the Lord if he can see his glory. And so the Lord, he takes Moses up in the cleft of this rock and he says to Moses, you cannot see my face, but I'm going to pass by you and you can see my glory, kind of my afterglow, if you will. And this is what happened. We read in chapter 33 that the Lord passes by Moses and Moses gets to see the glory of the Lord. And also in Exodus chapter 3, when the Lord first reveals himself to Moses, he says, uh, he's using his personal name. He says, I am who I am. This is his personal name of, of Yahweh, and it's often shortened to just I am. He told Moses, when you go to the people and they say, who has sent you? Say, I am has sent you. And so what Mark is doing here is one, showing that Jesus is above creation. He's, he's over nature. When Jesus passes by, when he makes that comment, Jesus is revealing his glory to his disciples as he walks on the water. And then when he gets in the boat and he says, do not fear, it is I. We miss this a little bit with our English translations. What it actually means, what it literally means is Jesus says, do not fear, I am. And so again, when we see him walking on water, when we see him passing by, revealing his glory, when we see Jesus say, I am, this is all pointing that Jesus Christ is Yahweh. He is God. And so when we factor all that stuff into this brief little story, it's just amazing what Mark is revealing about Jesus Christ. Well, I love the book of Matthew. I love the book of Mark. I hope you are as well. I'm praying for you. Enjoy the reading this week.